It's not every day that an AMI reporter finds themselves headed to a secluded village on Canada's west coast. So why am I, Grant Hardy, and eight blind and partially sighted high school students, along with their vision teachers, braving a two-hour bus journey down a bumpy logging road? Well, it all has to do with learning about the sea. The ocean is bigger than you can ever imagine. It's powerful and energy like none other. It is a place that is full of life. And the ocean really is the lifeblood of this planet. If I had to sum it up in three quick words, it would be big, scary, and weird. This is Sea School, Marine Science Camp. Hi, my name is Cameron McLeod. I am in grade 11 and I live in Nanaimo, BC. I am legally blind. Um, Stargardt is a form of juvenile macular degeneration and I see worse out of my right eye and a little bit better out of my left eye. I definitely believe I'm shy when you first get to know me, but I do like to like laugh a lot. I like to um, be creative. I like to go on adventures and just have fun. <laughs> For Cameron, transitioning to high school has had its challenges. Walking past students that don't understand and just want to push by you um, is really tough because I'm just trying to get to class to class. And then once I do get to class, the teachers that are supposed to be the most understanding still struggle to help me in the ways that I need. A lot of the time, they don't even know how to teach someone in my position. Um, that can't see the board, that can't see the projector, that can't get the same education as everyone else. But when Cameron heard about the opportunity to attend a week-long marine science camp specifically for students with vision loss, she felt excited. For me, this opportunity is just so important because I can't always feel like I'm getting enough out of life living with a visual impairment. Um, so when opportunities like these come up, I'm, I obviously want to jump for it. Cameron's mom, Kim McCauley, has watched her daughter's isolation in school, but hopes the camp provides her with increased confidence. Cam's a bit of an introvert and the, nothing really gets her too fired up. So when the opportunity was presented to herself, to her, uh, I think she said to herself, uh, no, uh, my, it's not for me. Science isn't my thing. But it really, it didn't take too long where she thought, I, you know, I think I might get something out of this. And maybe I'll have the opportunity to experience, uh, you know, learning science in a completely different way. So uh, I'm excited for her to feel that inclusion instead of exclusion. Fellow parent Camila Stewart hopes that her son, Grant Johnson, who is also partially sighted, feels included during marine science camp, which hasn't always been the case at school. A few of his earlier schools were basically negative towards us and kind of felt like they, they didn't really want him in their schools. Determined to give her son more opportunities, Camila moved with her kids to Vancouver so that Grant could get more assistance at school. We have great supports at Britannia Senior Secondary. Because of them, my son is becoming more independent. I'm so proud of him and I'm really thankful. For a city kid like Grant, being at camp will mean taking a break from hobbies like gaming and creating video game puzzles. However, he is looking forward to the experience. Seeing like a bunch of like animals like swimming around and like jumping out of the water and doing some like, crazy flip or something. Mila hopes that Marine Camp will also be an opportunity for Grant to reconnect with his First Nations heritage and values. Living in a city, it's, it's hard to be, to connect with nature sometimes. So it's pretty important in protecting the environment because everything is connected. Marine Science Camp is the brainchild of vision teacher Lynn Wales. Her passion for the ocean and improved accessibility to science is why our group of blind and partially sighted students, teachers, and me find ourselves headed to the small, isolated fishing village of Bamfield on the western edge of Vancouver Island. It's also the location of the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center, and for a week, we'll all call it home.
our group settles into the Bamfield Marine Science Centre campus and walks up the gravel main road for an orientation. All right, I see two, four, six, eight, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 people. Interpreter Algebra Young kicks things off. Welcome to Bamfield, everybody. Yeah, how is the road? It's <laughs> really bumpy. Yeah, so 76 kilometers of uh, raw Canadian wilderness separates you from Port Alberni, the nearest town. So uh, Bamfield is really quite small. The campus is perched on a cliff top overlooking the entrance to two inlets. Once the terminal station for the Pacific Telegraph Cable, the main campus building is now home to a library, offices, and classroom labs. So we were established um, 48 years ago as, as a primarily research institution. My name is Chris Neufeld. I'm the Associate Director of Education at the Banfield Marine Sciences Centre. The goal at that time was, was for Western Canadian universities to have a place to be, be immersed in the environment that they were studying to really raise the profile of marine science. And so the universities um, that, are, that are partners in the Marine Sciences Centre are the University of Alberta, University of Calgary, um, University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, and University of Victoria. Soon, the universities realized that Bamfield's location held more possibilities for education. The biodiversity is really high here. The, um, the access, just the access to this kind of environment is really rare. So we had this kind of, um, you know, we've got this huge infrastructure way out here on the coast at the end of this logging road. We've got flow through seawater in our labs to be able to hold, hold and house animals and, and to use them for research and education. Um, we've got this fleet of, of boats and, and docks to get us out to these even more remote places and actually see some of these environments firsthand. And so over, over time, our mandate has, has grown from just research um, to, to now be much more in inclusive of, of a number of different educational opportunities. For all those reasons and more, including the Centre's on-site lodging and meals, vision teacher Lynn Wales thought it the perfect location for the camp. However, it took strong advocacy from Lynn to convince the Marine Science Centre to greenlight this trip. Having a group of blind and partially sighted high school students was a new experience, and at first, there were some concerns. One of the things that's so, um, that, that I think makes these experiences out here so valuable is that we are out in the middle of nowhere and that we're really immersed in these in these sometimes um, challenging environments. And so, so the first question was just, you know, how, how can we accommodate this group to, to make sure that they can have the, those kinds of experiences and, and do it um, safely and accessibly. But according to Lynn, once the trip was approved, Bamfield went out of their way to be accommodating. Bamfield's been world class. Um, they're really keen to collaborate with us. They're really keen to support students who are here learning uh, through different means other than vision. Um, they've been open to us brailing and making copies of things in large print, bringing and sending tactile different resources for the students to be able to put their hands on and really get a sense of things, such as whale tails, for instance. Um, so Banfield's been wonderful and all of their instructors, for instance, have asked questions ahead of time. What's the best way we can support the students learning? Is there anything that we should know ahead of time? So they've been really, really keen to see this program take off. Our orientation ends with an inclusive art activity. Specifically, we're doing a slightly biologically minded art activity. We're doing something called gyotaku. Gyo meaning fish and taku meaning print, which means we're gonna take some fish, put some paint on them and smack them against a piece of paper. So these were real fish at a time. They were uh, immersed into a mold and then pulled out, and then they threw a bit of silicone in there, and now you have a fish uh, that is not a real fish, but looks just like one. It was simple. Just add some paint to the silicone fish. When ready, press a paper or fabric against it, and voila, you have a colorful fish imprint. Cameron thought it was a fun and accessible way to kick off the camp. I like it because you can really express your creativity and it doesn't have to be perfect art, it's just for fun. Because in high school, most art classes are very detail oriented and they don't even think about all the different kinds of art that you can do tactilely and, and 
in different ways because they just focus on like the, the detail and like the precise art. And so it's really fun to do something different. Algebra was really thrilled to be working with this group of teens. I was really impressed that they were able to throw down the way that they did. I don't have to worry about these kids. With that done, it was time to turn in for our first night at Marine Science Camp. In this lab, we're gonna be talking about marine invertebrate diversity. Who knows what that means? Day two, our group gathers in the building known as the Whale Lab. Its flow through seawater system provides a steady hum as vital ocean water is pumped through the homes of various marine invertebrates, which, according to Banfield interpreter Kayleen Meredith, is the topic of our first lab. We're gonna be talking today about animals that don't have spines, that live in the ocean, and a variety of them. We're gonna split up into three groups. I'll be with one group, Maria will be with another group, and Julie will be with a third group. It's an opportunity for each group of students, vision teachers, and interpreters to get some hands-on time with creatures such as sea stars, sponges, sea cucumbers, crabs, and sea anemones. Cameron's troops meet an anemone. Its soft, circular body sprouts what seem to be harmless-looking tentacles. The tentacles have what are essentially tiny harpoons that they use to eat and also to defend themselves. And they kind of grab onto them and just kind of slowly move them into the center. Yeah, yeah, they'll grab onto them and move them into the center and they've got their mouth on the center and their mouth has basically just a big hole down the middle of the body. Another group checks out sea stars with interpreter Maria. So this one is called a blood star because of the color. This is something I found out recently. I'm gonna make you guys smell this one. <laughs> Tell me, oh yeah. Tell me if you can figure out what it smells like. Give it, get, get in there, like really sniff it. Give it a good sniff. Like... Oh, sniff it. It smells yeah. like some kind of food. It does, yep. It's a type of food. Like jerky almost? Cameron's gang meets an animal that resembles a basic household item, the sponge. They have little holes in their bodies that they suck water through and they filter feed. So they'll take in little bits of animals and uh, algae and stuff like that and they'll eat that and then filter the rest of the water back out of them. Yeah. This one feels like an actual sponge that you like clean yeah. with. <laughs> According to Kayleen, the interpreters made slight changes to the lab to better serve the students. I think a greater emphasis on touch is incredibly valuable. Typically what we'll do, we'll, we'll do a fair bit of board work at the beginning. So instead of that, we did more of the work at the stations, which I think in some ways was better. Um, because it allowed more individual interaction with instructors and the students. Of course, the labs aren't the traditional home for these creatures. A lot of the animals that we'll be looking at, you'll be able to find in the intertidal. You'll be able to find them on the rocky beaches, on, on the shore, yeah. On, on the part of the shore that is underwater at least some of the time. It just so happens that there's a nearby beach that fits just that description, Aguilar Beach. So, wearing life jackets, it was time to get to the docks and boat across the inlet to West Bamfield. Interpreter Maria leads the way on the other side. Due to the threat of a powerful rogue wave crashing onto the rocky beach and pulling us into the sea, wearing life jackets was mandatory it's one of the few things Maria asked us to keep in mind as we were about to start exploring each student paired with a vision teacher. Do not pick up a rock bigger than the size of your head, okay? It'll, you'll probably drop it immediately and there's a lot of things living under there that you will crush immediately if you do that. And if you do pick up a rock, make sure you put it back the same way you picked it up. Excited? <laughs> All right. Okay, the teachers fun. are excited. Have fun. As promised, mixed in amongst the rocks and seaweed were little pools of seawater. And then this is another hermit crab here. Bamfield interpreter Tom picks one up to show Grant. Oh. Flip, flip himself over. And he's got little blue feet. 
Looks like he's about to jump off. Yeah, I'll catch him if he does. Vision teacher Carrie Barclay uses a smartphone to aid her student, Samantha Sorensen. I can see things close up and I can see things around me. I just can't see far away and I can't see details. So using the iPhone is perfect. She's able to zoom in and use the zoom feature on it to actually see further than what she can. Student Haley Olinick wants to pursue a career in marine biology and really dug the beach exploration. We got to find a few sea anemones. I found a lot of sea stars, which was really exciting because I've always loved them. Being from interior BC, we never have these kind of animals. And even just hearing and smelling the ocean is like one of my favorite things. <laughs> I gotta agree with Haley, taking in the sea was great. Though the train gave my cane skills a real workout, which according to Lynn Wales is part of the idea. The more opportunities we can expose the students to, the more experiences, the more places we can take them, um, will enhance their overall education experience. And those opportunities will just keep on coming as our day winds down. Tomorrow promises even more challenging terrain. Did everyone make it into the forest? Ooh. So far, so I think good. so. We haven't lost anyone on the way. Another day, and for some, another new experience. Welcome to the coastal temperate rainforest. Oh BC's coastal mountains cause precipitation, which, as interpreter Owen Newson points out, leaves behind damp, wet, and muddy rainforests. Wet roots are quite slippery and dangerous. If you jump onto a root, um, your foot might slip off, and then you might fall on the ground. Um, so we're going to move very carefully through the rainforest. Student and vision teacher pairs navigate the tricky terrain. At times, deep puddles threaten to slosh into gumshoes. I'm surprised my teeth didn't get wet there. Like the others, Cameron was glad to have come prepared with her rain gear. Yeah, the weather today, it's pretty rainy out. It could be worse, but it's not too bad. Um, I looked up a couple times and like a bunch of drops fell off the branches of the trees. Some of the surrounding forest is made up of cedars and western hemlock trees. Owen notices a decaying log. There's all kinds of things living on this log. So various species of moss. There's probably some lichen on here as well. Uh, the beginnings of some salal bushes. With a packed day ahead, it was time to sludge through the muck and head back. The rainforest and ocean are both complex ecosystems and are in a dynamic relationship with each other. It's complex, intricate, and in danger from human activities. Which is why we headed to Pachina Bay to see the impact of plastics in the ocean firsthand. Interpreter Owen explains our part. What we do want to try and do as we make our way along the beach is look for garbage. Um, big pieces, small pieces, anything we can find. I know you guys brought some garbage bags. We'll see if this dog follows us or not. Pick a partner. One's going to pick up, one's going to hold the garbage bag, and then you're going to switch about halfway down. As we begin our trek down the beach, Cameron immediately notices differences from the last one. Well, the last beach, it was really cool. There was lots of rocks and it was kind of hard to navigate around, but we did find a lot of cool creatures. But I really like this beach because it's nice and open and the wind is blowing in your face. And up there where it was dry, we got to like touch the sand and feel like how soft it was. And down here it gets a little more muddy, but it's still really fun to play in. At first glance, what appeared to be a picturesque beach soon yielded some toxic treasures. Nice, looks like part of a bottle lid. Oh, here's another piece over here. This is everywhere once you start looking. Oh, a toothbrush. Yeah. Oh, nasty. Although some of the junk was delivered by surf, others were clearly from local activity. Student Haley Alenek. We found one burnt up uh, campsite, it looks like, where somebody had a fire and they had thrown their uh, beer cans and stuff in there. So we had to get in there, pick up all the little sharp metal bits and some broken glass, and that was really sad. 
After walking one kilometer of the seemingly clear, sandy beach, each pair had collected nearly half a garbage bag worth of garbage. Owen explains the damage plastics have on the marine ecosystem. So plastic doesn't really decompose. It does break down, but it only breaks down into smaller pieces of plastic. So it doesn't actually decompose into its like chemical constituent parts. Those microplastics can be so tiny that even plankton can eat them. Uh, and then they accumulate all the way up through a food chain. So whatever eats the plankton would then have that plastic in its stomach, and then whatever eats that, and so on and so forth. And what's at the top of the food chain? For Haley, it's a message that really hits home. Oh, it makes me so sad, <laughs> so sad. Um, I wanna work in, with animals from the ocean and stuff, and when scientists find a dead bird and they can get into the guts and stuff and they find all those pieces of plastic because they can't digest it, so it just sits in there and probably poisons them. It's really sad. And yeah, it kind of shows, like drives it home with even being on our coast, on the BC coast. So that sucks and it hurts. <laughs> Hurts my heart a lot. It's a sobering experience that might keep some of us awake tonight as we close out another day in Bamfield. Who remembers what a cetacean is? Whales. Yeah, whales or dolphins. Another new day and on to another new lesson. Today's topic, marine mammals. When it comes to the sea, marine mammals really capture the imagination Interpreter Mikasa Kwafe talked to the group about a range of mammals that live in the ocean, including sea otters, walruses, and the always popular whales. Um, so we have two types of cetaceans. We have the odontocetes and the mysticetes. Odontocetes are the toothed whales, and the mysticetes are the baleen whales. The presentation includes opportunities to get hands-on with bones and baleen, the special cartilage filters most large whales use to filter feed. The bone is hollow, the jawbone is hollow. It functions to receive and focus and transmit sound to the ear bone. Mikasa mentions something that generates anticipation in the group. Right now, um, we have a lot of gray whales around here because, and they're, they're together, but that's because they are all feeding on the same thing on the herring spot. With an ocean exploration as our next activity, there's hope that we can luck out and see some gray whales in the wild. So once again, it was time to pop on our life jackets, slather on our sunscreen, and hit the docks. My name's Dave, I'll be your skipper for the next two hours. Uh, today's gonna be a fun trip. The weather is beautiful, sunny, and fairly calm. Our vessel, the Barclay Star, is a 10-meter high-speed aluminum boat. Its enclosed pilot's cabin offers protection from the wind and spray. I and a few brave souls sit in the rear exposed area, thankful for our extra layers of clothing. Whales may be large, but the ocean is much, much bigger, making them hard to find. But along the way, Dave cuts the engine. Something even more elusive is spotted. Yay! This is my second ever sea otter! It's, it's just off maybe about 50 meters away from the boat on the right side. With hopes that the otter sighting is a good omen, we continued onward. Soon we reached our destination, not far off the shore of a beach. According to interpreter Olivia Walker, the whales use a unique method to gather herring spawn from such shallow sites. So they get into like two, th uh, two, three meters of water and they scrape their mouths on the bottom of the ocean and they pick up all this sediment and all these fish and all these invertebrates and also the eggs and then they filter out what they don't want. So they spit out the sediment and the water and they keep all the good stuff. At the front of the boat, Lynn spots a blow. Ooh, I just saw it. So it's on the right side of the boat. I just saw the blow come up. When the whales come up to breathe, their blowholes release a jet of moist air and water. Students and teachers gather with cameras, bones, and visual aids at the ready, hoping to capture glimpses of fins, backs, and tails. Oh, amazing. There's, oh, look the at the one, fins Yeah, the up. fins. So straight ahead, right by the beach line. We are surrounded, team. There, I, think, I think there's about six or eight whales, actually. 
So the, the grey whales aren't quite as charismatic as the hump ba- humpback whales and they don't really jump up and slap down like the humpbacks do. But one whale decided to prove Olivia wrong. That was so cool, wasn't it? With our time up, Dave kicked on the engines and we made our way back to the main campus. For Cameron, getting close to the gray whales was a real highlight. Yeah, we got to see some of their fins and um, it was really cool because they were laying on their side and they were diving a bit. And so, yeah, but mostly we got to listen to them, which was really interesting. They were probably like 100 to like 100 meters like away from the boat. So I was surprised that they weren't like scared of us at all. Lynn was happy to share her passion with the group. Every time I see whales, it's exciting. Every time I'm able to see a marine mammal in its natural environment, I often find I catch my breath. And I love the sense of how small I feel. Although marine camp's been fun, there's also schoolwork. Each day ends with Cameron and the others writing journals assisted by their teachers. So I can just say like, in the morning half of the day, we did this and this, and it made me feel like this because we did that and this and that. That would be a fine way of approaching it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the entire week ends with student presentations highlighting what they learned, like Grant, who didn't realize that commercial whaling was still happening. I didn't know that um, that they were used like facts like they would used for meat, oil, and belly. The presentations end with a heartfelt thanks to organizers Lynn and fellow vision teacher Sophia Devchi, who was really impressed by the students. We are meant to be out of our comfort zones, every single one of us. The instructors in the program, the teachers, those of the visually impaired, the orientation mobility specialists, and the students. We all had to struggle at some point, and that's what learning is about. I really hope the students would feel at the end of this week is that they belong in science, that science is something that they can access, that it's interesting, that it has a place for them. It's clear that the approach to teaching has evolved since I was in high school. Seeing students like Cameron finish marine science camp beaming with confidence proves that learning outside the classroom in an inclusive environment is important. We all benefit when barriers to science come down, allowing people with all abilities to contribute. After all, the sea is big, and there's still so much to learn about the ocean. For a week in Bamfield, a group of students who normally feel left out of science were let in And as we leave, I'm certain that some future scientists leave with us. Host, Grant Hardy. Producer, Amit Tandon. Videographer and editor, Sergio Vera Barahona. Audio assistant, Alvaro Quijano. Audio post, Mark Phoenix. Integrated described video specialist, Ron Rickford. Senior producer, Michelle Dudas. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2019 Accessible Media Incorporated.